Hello everybody, this is Esoteric Yeti. Namaste. What you're about to watch is a summary documentary on my recently published book, The Lucifer Mystery Revealed. It is an academic perspective on the historicity of Lucifer within the church and the occult. By the end of this documentary, you should know who Lucifer really was. If you're interested in a copy of the recent book, you can message me on Instagram at Esoteric Eddie, or you can go to EsotericEddie.com and order one there, or you can go to Amazon and order one there as well. Well, I hope you enjoy the video. Peace. Who is Lucifer? To some, he is the supreme ruler of evil. To others, he is the bringer of knowledge and wisdom. Lucifer has progressed through the ages to a deified figure that was once a disheveled Satan. This is taught as fact within the church and fanaticized by the occult. Some of the early works of pop culture to help shape this idea of Lucifer were Dante's Inferno and Milton's Paradise Lost. In Dante's Inferno, we see Lucifer trapped in a lake of ice, invigorated to regain his place in the heavens that he was outcasted from. In Milton's Paradise Lost, we were given the axiom, it is better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. These works were among the first to construct Lucifer into an anti-hero character. The religious and quasi-religious believe he is damned to hell as a degenerated Satan who lost his position of power among the angels. Lucifer is seen as an enlightened being who sacrificed himself in order to give us knowledge against the natural order of God's design. Now, although these concepts are amazing philosophically and mythologically, we need to unravel this Lucifer character through history to see if we can uncover a true Lucifer, a real character that did exist. And when we do this, we find that Lucifer is actually a misunderstanding from mistranslated texts of our ancient past. Although Lucifer as a character didn't actually exist in the Bible, as I will show, there was a real deity in our ancient past who Lucifer was based on. Chapter 1. The Terminological Misunderstanding of Lucifer The Christian world owes its religion to Judaism and the pre-Judaic cultures that influenced Judaism. Without Judaism or the old world of the Levant, there would be no Christianity and there definitely would be no Lucifer. Of course, the world was introduced to Lucifer through the English version of the Bible. But prior to the English version, we had the Latin. Prior to that, we had the Greek. And prior to all of them, we had the original Hebrew Old Testament. Going backwards in time, we can understand how we got to Lucifer as a character. The English version uses Lucifer once as an uppercase word, causing it to become a name. In the Latin, where the English was primarily translated from, we see Lucifer multiple times, not as an uppercase word, but a lowercase adjective. Lucifer is actually a Latin word. The root words 
for Lucifer are lux or lucis, meaning light, and fere, to bring. Thus, the occult interpretation of Lucifer, the light bearer. And in the Greek, where we would see Lucifer today, we would see phosphoros, which also means the light bearer or something bright. And again, it was used as an adjective, a lowercase word. Now, the source for all of these, of course, is the Hebrew. And in the Hebrew, where we would see Lucifer today, we would see Halel ben Shahar. And this is loosely translated as Halel, the shining one, son of Shahar. Thus, the Lucifer, the shining one, son of the morning. The reason being is Shahar is also a Hebrew word for dawn. So what was being said was Halel, which is a deity, son of another deity by the name of Shahar. Now, Isaiah, the scribe and prophet who wrote the famous Lucifer words, it can be assumed, was aware of the old world mythologies. Judaism is sometimes broken up into two basic categories, pre-exilic Judaism and post-exilic Judaism. The exile, or the exilic period, is when the Jews were taken captive by the Babylonians sometime around the early 6th century BC. Prior to the exile, the Bible had not yet been officially written. And prior to the exile, Judaism was a loose religion, and it was still based on the ancient Canaanite mythologies, which were based on a polytheistic belief system. In the famed Lucifer verse of Isaiah 14, 12, as we read on, we see in verse 13 that Lucifer says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now, first of all, Isaiah was using all of this verbiage as metaphors towards a Babylonian king. Isaiah, being a prophet, foresaw the downfall of the enslavers. He was using the metaphors of Halal ben Shahar towards the Babylonian king, Sennacherib, most likely. But when it is stated by Isaiah that this king, who saw himself as Halal ben Shahar, wanted to sit upon the Mount of Congregation on the sides of the north, we get a glimpse as to what Isaiah is actually referencing. In the old pre-Judaic world of the gods, there was a council that was headed by El. Among the lower deities, there was the famous Baal or Baal. In the 1920s, north of Syria, we found a series of clay tablets, and among them, one of them titled the Baal Cycle Text, we see that the gods congregate on Mount Zaphon, which literally means Mount of the North. And within these texts, we find the gods, Halel and Shahar. However, Halel in these texts is known as Athtar. And in the text, it is stated that Baal, being one of the contending leader gods, has stepped down from the throne, and the gods are trying to find a replacement. And among them, Astar steps up to the responsibility, but it is then later realized that he is not fit to rule on the throne. So he steps down and continues to rule from his respective kingdom, which is down on earth. The Baal cycle texts are part of the Ugaritic society, and they are dated back to about the 12th and 13th centuries BC. Now, another significant aspect of Athtar, or Halel, is that his name and also his character represents and was signified by the star or planet Venus. Athtar, being a male deity, is actually a rendition or counterpart to the more ancient female Astarte, also known as Ishtar in ancient times, who would later become the Greek goddess Aphrodite and the Roman goddess Venus. 
Venus as a planet or star, as it is sometimes called, in its celestial mythology is seen as the star of the morning. It is the brightest celestial object in the morning preceding the sun. Therefore, Isaiah, being the educated and wise scribe and prophet that he was, was using multiple metaphors to refer to this Babylonian king, saying that he is like Hillel, he is like Athtar, he is like Venus, thinking that he is something bright and of importance, but will soon be overshadowed by the rising sun or God. So, taking this into consideration, we now know that when Isaiah wrote Halal ben Shahar, he wasn't meaning to refer to a Lucifer, a deity as we would understand it now. He was using metaphorical language to insult and condemn the Babylonian kings who would later take the Jews captive, but also be taken down themselves. However, there is another reason why the word Lucifer might have been used in the Latin translations. It was Eusebius Hieronymus, or Jerome, who was commissioned to translate the Old Testament into the Latin Vulgate, which the Roman Catholic Church would go on to use as the authorized version. While Jerome was completing his work in the 4th century Common Era, there were some schisms or debates happening within the church. During the Constantinian dynasty, there was a new doctrine being taught by the priesthood, and that was Arianism, which was the belief that Jesus was a separate creation donned by God, thus another Christ could be donned. In other words, Jesus was a man who was given authority by God. Thus, the Constantinian dynasty or anybody could also claim to have been given this right or authority by God to be the Christ on earth. One of the bishops who was fiercely against Arianism was none other than Saint Lucifer, Bishop of Cagliari in Italy. Lucifer, among his contemporaries and followers, the Luciferians, were banished and exiled. And during his exile, St. Lucifer wrote some polemical letters to the Constantinian dynasty, specifically Constantius II. In St. Lucifer's open letter titled Apostate of Kings, he addresses Constantius II, saying, You say, if I have done evil, If I have professed heresy, then God would have punished me. But listen to the Holy Scripture, which tells us that God long spared even foreigners, but in the end, they received the reward of their crimes. After the Constantinian dynasty died out, the new empire was sympathetic towards the anti-Aryans and allowed Lucifer and his followers to come back. But this time, St. Lucifer was fiercely debating the previous Arians whether or not they could be accepted back into the church. It was concluded by the Luciferians or anti-Arians that any priest or clergyman could not be received back into the church or forgiven for their heresy against Christ. But then the Arians or previous Arians debated, saying that, It was Christ alone that could forgive, not a bishop such as St. Lucifer. It was St. Lucifer who stood up to the Constantinian dynasty and the Arian sellouts as he stayed true to Christ and the church. But St. Lucifer, now old in his age and guided by his fury, lost the debates. He was disgraced and excommunicated by yet again the clever Arians with their loyalty to the institution of the church and state. These public debates were observed, witnessed, and written down by the famous Eusebius Hieronymus or Jerome, the translator and writer of the Latin Vulgate in which the word Lucifer was inserted and introduced to the world. Jerome left behind a textual observation of Lucifer and his debates and his political downfall, titled, 
the dialogue against the Luciferians. There is no hard evidence for this being Jerome's motive in using the word Lucifer. However, it would be pretty arrogant to think that as wise and educated as he was, he wouldn't have at least thought about it before using the word. In Jerome's time, Christ on earth was the Constantinian dynasty, and Saint Lucifer was literally a Lucifer going against this God on earth who ended up losing. Thus, Saint Lucifer's name and story could have been just another metaphor on top of the Isaiah metaphors of Venus and Athtar that were being used to describe the Babylonian kings. Now, although Lucifer was never a real character in the Bible, but only created by the later Christian and occult minds through their misunderstandings of the ancient text, there was a real deity who Lucifer was based on through the imagery and story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, which we will reveal later on. Chapter 2 The Hellenistic and Early Christian Era The understanding of the Lucifer metaphor and the creation of him as an archetype did not go unnoticed. The famous Protestant reformer from the 16th century, Calvin, wrote about this misunderstanding, saying that Isaiah concludes that the tyrant differs in no respect from other men, though his object was to lead men to believe that he was some god. He employs an elegant metaphor by comparing him to Lucifer. The exposition of this passage, which some have given, as it referred to Satan, has arisen from ignorance, for the context plainly shows that these statements must be understood in reference to the king of the Babylonians. Yet it was an instance of very gross ignorance to imagine that Lucifer was the king of the devils, and that the prophet gave him this name. But as these inventions have no probability whatsoever, let us pass by them as useless fables. The Christian era was born out of the Hellenistic era, which brought about a sort of renaissance when Alexander the Great started to take over some areas of the Middle East. Within that era, the Greek philosophers started to interact with the Jewish priests, and out of this, new concepts were born. Aristobulus, the Hellenistic Jewish philosopher of Alexandria from 180 BC, was one of the first to say that Greek thought originated in ancient Jewish philosophy. Philo, also a very important Hellenistic Jewish philosopher born about 25 BC, also furthered this thought. The Hellenistic Renaissance created an immense respect and intrigue from the Western European mind into the ancient Judaic sacred text. Oregon Adamantius of Alexandria, born around 180 of the Common Era, was one of the first prolific and important Christian scholars. In his De Principis, he wrote, We are taught as follows by the prophet Isaiah regarding another opposing power, who formerly was Lucifer. He might show by this that he had been at one time in heaven and had enjoyed a share in that light which all the saints participate. Here we see Oregon Adamantius setting up the Christian world and later the occult world with the idea that Lucifer is a real character. Oregon Adamantius was quite psychedelic. His beliefs, his doctrines, and his writings were later deemed as heretical. Among early Christianity, a few hundred years before the Common Era and a few hundred years during the Common Era, there arose Gnosticism. This broad term is used to reference the variations of Christianity that arose during its early years that had an underlying belief in mysticism, more importantly, that the God of the Bible, known as the Demiurge or Yaldabaoth by the Gnostics, 
was an imposter who was really keeping us trapped here on this physical world to suffer, and that Jesus was less of a savior and more of an ascended master who was here to teach us the mysteries and warn us of this truth. It would be Gnosticism that would set the world up to later on receive and accept the Luciferian doctrine. Gnosticism was born out of the Hellenistic era when Greek philosophy experimented and interacted with Jewish philosophy, creating psychedelic twists on the perception of the Bible. The Gnostic Gospels, also known as the Nag Hammadi Library or the Dead Sea Scrolls, were discovered in the 1940s out in the Middle East and contained some of the oldest manuscripts of the Bible, and among them were strange texts that were never read before, which contained these mysteries and truths. Irenaeus, the famous Greek bishop of the second century, wrote in his Against Heresies that the Gnostics were agents of Satan. Among the various Gnostic groups, we have the now infamous Cathars. They were a religious group that lived predominantly in France with a belief in a sort of mystical Christianity. The Cathars were opposed to the Catholic Church and believed that it was the synagogue of Satan. Around this time, the church was becoming more institutionalized as a governmental power and focusing less on its spiritual obligations, which caused a lot of mysticism to arise. The Cathars were ambushed under Pope Innocent III in what is known as the Albigensian Crusade. Bishop Arnaud Amari wrote to Pope Innocent about the genocide, saying, our forces spared neither rank, nor sex, nor age. About 20,000 people lost their lives at the point of the sword. Gnosticism, along with other heretical ideas or simple opposers to the church, over the course of time would be abolished, persecuted, and sometimes even killed under the Inquisition. According to Henry Charles Lee in his 1887 History of the Inquisition of the Middle Ages, there was a tension growing between the church and the people, which was becoming dangerous. After the church changed its laws of succession, giving that power to those already in power instead of being elected by the people, this tension began. It was during this time where bribes were being taken by the clergymen. Strict tithes were being ordered by the church as they manipulated the people to pay to get into heaven. Many books were burned and access to alternate viewpoints were banished. During this era, many martyrs and rebels arose to the call to stop the church from becoming corrupt. Among them was Arnold of Brescia. He preached in the streets of Italy against the wrongdoing of the church and captivated the minds of the people and caused movements among them. His influence was so invigorating that the Second Lateran Council in 1139 sought to suppress the revolt he incited in the city of Lombard by condemning him in an attempt to silence him. Arnold did not back down. Pope Innocent II ordered him to be imprisoned and his writings burned. Eventually, he was burned at the stake for standing up to the church. The church was becoming corrupt. There arose freelance priests and clergymen on the streets who began praying and preaching for free and giving back to the community as the church was supposed to. And because of this, Pope Lucius III officially began the Institutional Inquisition in 1184 to bestow the Church's authority to seek out and punish heretics. The Church had created a self-fulfilling prophecy where they were the physical incarnate of evil on the earth as they punished people for simply trying to give back and express a free-minded spiritualism. They became Yaldabaoth, the Demiurge. They were imposters. They were the agents of Satan in the synagogue of Satan. Through the Dark Ages, the mysteries went underground and would foster 
a certain hate and vengeance towards the church. And once we had the new Renaissance and the Enlightenment era, the mysteries would come out of the underground, out of the darkness, and shine bright and become the Luciferian doctrine taught by the classical occultist. Chapter 3 Occultism and the Start of the Luciferian Age In the 18th century, during the Age of Enlightenment, humanity was able to break away from the Church and its Inquisition. During this era, we were able to study and translate sacred texts which would create new philosophies and secret societies that would revamp the way we see spiritualism and mysticism. And in the 19th century, another key figure in all of this was the master occult writer Alphonse Constant, later known as Eliphas Levy. He was a major influence on the later classical occultists such as Blavatsky and Crowley. Blavatsky would often mention that Levy was her prime source for academic inspiration, and Crowley would even say that he was the reincarnate of Levy. Levy also changed the way that we would think about Lucifer and the principles of the Luciferian doctrine. His major contribution to Blavatsky's beliefs was his conceptualization of the astral light. It is the force that binds all and connects humanity with its soul. It is where alchemists, magicians, clairvoyants, and so on gain direct access to spiritual powers. It is akin to the Akashic records made famous by American clairvoyant Edgar Cayce. To Levy, the astral light was the supreme power of the universe, or God, which was ruled by equilibrium, and when understood, it could be used for good or evil. Although Levy was an excellent writer on the occult, he himself was far from a Luciferian or Satanist in the prime sense of it. His motive was more so toward expressing the values of mystical Christianity. He had a very interesting life of rebellion himself and sought to bring the true Catholicism to the world, one where the power of brotherly love and true communal effort reigned to bring forth the sciences which were a testament to God's genius. He was repeatedly condemned and imprisoned by the church and the governmental authorities for his writings on God and the true nature of worship. He gave up a secure life as a destined-to-be priest for the life of an occultist, an artist, and writer educating the world on what the lost understandings of the biblical philosophies were. On Lucifer, in his History of Magic, he states, if, for example, as an ancient tradition informs us, some of the angels whom God had created fell all too soon, and if these, as they also say, were precisely the most brilliant of the angels, one may very well understand by this fall that they sought a new road, a new form of activity, other occupations, and another life than those orthodox or more passive spirits who remained in the realm assigned to them and made no use of liberty, the appanage of all of them. He uses the legend of the fallen angels to further explain why Lucifer could be seen as benevolent in the occult. Basically, he is saying theoretically, if the story is true, then of course mankind was graced with the acquaintance of a powerful and wise creature, such as the one encountered in the Garden of Eden tale. And this serpent, although cast out by God, is still in essence capable of being excellent and intellectually influential. Levy was no amateur by any means. He knew well about the misunderstandings of the Isaiah verse and simply speculated on the introspective meanings we could glean from the Lucifer mythos. To him, the idea of it was beautiful and epic. He further expresses his outlook on the mythos in Mysteries of Magic by stating, what is more absurd and more impious than to attribute the name of Lucifer to the devil, that is, to personified evil? The intellectual Lucifer is the spirit of intelligence and love. It is the paraclete. It is the Holy Spirit, while the physical Lucifer is the great agent of universal magnetism. That is powerful poetry, indeed. Levy was an amazing artist in general. 
His most influential work that influenced Luciferians and the like, however, was not his writing on Lucifer, but his illustration of the Baphomet. This image has been used by all sorts of mystics, atheists, Satanists, and theologians to either depict Satan or the idea of free will. It is also sometimes attributed to Lucifer. However, this creature with the head of a goat, torso of a human, and legs of a goat sitting on a globe with one arm raised and another one pointed downward, with wings, long horns, and an extra horn-like torch protruding through the middle of its head with esoteric symbolism and an axiom, was actually never intended to be used as a symbol for Satan. To Levy, the Baphomet, in its occult sense, represented the most sacred principles in occultism and encompassed the pantheistic and magical figure of the Absolute. Levy further explains the symbolism of the Baphomet in his Ritual and High Magic, saying, The flame of intelligence shining between his horns is the magic light of the universal balance, the image of the soul elevated above matter as the flame whilst being tied to matter, shines above it. The ugly beast's head expresses the horror of the sinner, whose materially acting, solely responsible part has to bear the punishment exclusively, because the soul is insensitive according to its nature and can only suffer when it materializes. So, as we see, Eliphas Levi is incidentally setting up the later theosophists neo-gnostics and luciferians to view lucifer or the serpent in the garden of eden as a divine being with a righteous cause to help humanity uplift and elevate its consciousness against the strict orders of the god of the bible the occultists that followed after levy would further this idea of lucifer primarily through a quasi-christian perspective through the atlantean theory Many occultists, such as Blavatsky, believed in a lost era of mankind, a golden age called the Atlantean Age, where mankind was preceded by the gods whom existed here and through cataclysms or downfalls had to restart civilization, and through that crucial transition, mankind was birthed. And some of these Atlantean gods took it upon themselves to pass down the ancient knowledge through secret societies. And it was these gods that would later be demonized as the Luciferian deities. In a presentation by Blavatsky titled The Timeless Kabiri explains how the gods of all cultures stem back to a source of gods that she refers to as the Kabiri stating that these gods are known throughout the major civilizations of the past under different names. She declares, From Manu, Thoth Hermes, Oannes Dagon, and Edris Enoch, down to Plato and Panadores, all tell us of seven divine dynasties, of seven Lemurian and seven Atlantean divisions of the earth, of the seven primitive and dual gods who descended from their celestial abode and reign on earth, teaching mankind astronomy, architecture, and all the other sciences that have come down to us. This premise is what has elevated the Luciferian doctrine, because now when the biblical mythos is understood through the acknowledgement that all religions stem from a polytheistic source of deities akin to us, then Lucifer, in a physical sense, can be but a god who sought to go against the will of these other spacemen seeking to control us. Lucifer, to the occultist, is a god who wanted to teach us and groom us into a fully realized, independent being. Furthermore, she explains how the flood myth of Noah is of course based on a much more ancient tale than that of the biblical one. This she is correct about. She explains that the tale is much older than modern humans and that the Jews simply took the tale and re-engineered it to fit their culture as do all nations. But in the same paragraph, she forms an opposition between the occultists and the church. She indicated that the Titans and Kabirs have been invariably made out 
by the theologians and some pious symbologists as indissolubly connected with the grotesque personage called devil, and every proof to the contrary has been hitherto as invariably rejected and ignored. Therefore, the occultists must neglect nothing which may tend to defeat this conspiracy of slander. This is the inherent battle between the occult and the church for the narrative of how biblical history shall be understood. The church claims that there is and always was one God, and that he is the creator of all, and through Christ we can understand this ultimate truth. The occult says that God is a myriad of gods that were responsible for the genetic creation and upbringing of man which resulted in various religions, and through Christ consciousness, we can move beyond this truth. Blavatsky believed the power in this historical secret lay within the teachings of the Chaldean Zoroaster. These ancient deities, in their most esoteric form, were of a cosmic fire, and this is why they were venerated as such in the Zoroastrian fire temples, or as gods of light. In Blavatsky's view, this is also why eventually, in the church, they were demonized and assigned to the fires of hell, a sort of psychological reversal. To Blavatsky, Zoroaster was the seminal figure procuring the true doctrine of the ancients, and his role was so important that it was truly he who would return as the long-awaited Messiah of the Jews. This makes sense in an academic aspect because Zoroastrianism is debated as the source of end times and messianic beliefs of Judaism. Of this whole concept, she dramatically claims, by the Jewish sect of the Pharisees, whose great teacher was Hillel, the whole angelology and symbolism of the Zoroastrians were accepted and infused into Jewish thought, and their Hebrew Kabbalah, or secret book of occult wisdom, was the offspring of the Chaldean Kabbalah. This deathless work is the receptacle of all the ancient lore of Chaldea, Persia, Medea, Bactria, and the pre-Iranian period. The name by which its students in the secret lodges of the Jewish Pharisees were known was Kabirim from Kabiri, the mystery gods of Assyria. Zoroastrianism and Magianism proper were then the chief source of both esoteric Judaism and esoteric Christianity. But not only has this subtle spirit left their latter religion under the pressure of worldliness and skeptical inquiry, it also long ago left Judaism. The modern Hebrews are not Kabbalists, but Talmudists, holding on to the later interpretations of the Mosaic canon. Only here and there can we now find a real Kabbalist who knows what the true religion of his people is and whence it was derived. Blavatsky and the classical occultists such as herself had a powerful intuition about our past and an Atlantean era in which the gods existed prior to mankind and a cataclysm occurred and then they had to pass down knowledge to us and in this history, Lucifer really existed. Although they were on to something, they weren't academically correct about their conclusions. There was a time in our ancestral legends in which the gods did exist here and did pass down knowledge to us, as is told by our former Sumerian ancestors. Blavatsky was on the right track and had a proper intuition about our past. However, there is no way she could have known about the Sumerians in their entirety. The Sumerians were already buried underneath the sands of time during the last reign of the Assyrian Empire, as is made apparent by its last king, King Ashurbanipal. There is a physical text which we have in existence in which King Ashurbanipal boasts that the god of scribes has bestowed upon him the skills to read and write the languages from before the flood. The Sumerians, as I will get into in the last section of this documentary, were the source for all major civilizations and religions to follow after them. However, Blavatsky and the classical occultists could not have known this because the Sumerians were being rediscovered underneath the sands of time in the Middle East during 
the mid 1800s during the time period in which Levi Blavatsky and those to come after them were living. It wouldn't be until almost a century later that we would begin to actually fully understand the complexity and significance of the Sumerians and their writings. Although Lucifer never existed in the Bible, the occult version of Lucifer utilizing the story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden and the Atlantean theory holds not only philosophical merit, but also some historical veracity when the Sumerian connection is taken into consideration. Before we dive into the Sumerian connection and reveal who Lucifer actually was, if there ever was one in our history, we must take a look at the Book of Enoch and its important role in shaping the concept of fallen angels. Chapter 4 The Book of Enoch Enoch is mentioned within the Bible in the early book of Genesis. Very briefly, Enoch is the great-grandfather of Noah, the survivor of the flood. Enoch is mentioned briefly as living up to 365 days and then mysteriously being taken up to heaven to be with God. He is among the few within the Bible who are privileged not to die a mortal death, but to be transferred directly to heaven. It is said that after this transference or transition, Enoch transformed into the angel Metatron. This comes primarily from more mystical doctrines of Judaism within the Babylonian Talmud and the mystical Kabbalistic text. And because of this, Enoch is seen as one of the most powerful archetypes within mystical teachings. The actual Book of Enoch is a composition comprising of several different writings. For example, the Book of the Watchers or the Book of the Heavenly Luminaries. The oldest fragments of the writings of the Book of Enoch go back to about 200 BCE. The Book of Enoch and its collection of writings was highly regarded in ancient times. However, later in its history, during the early Christian era, it was excluded and taken out of the canonical works. Church Father St. John Chrysostom an archbishop of Constantinople and contemporary of Jerome, was explicitly against the Book of Enoch. In those days, the book was prohibited from being taught, circulated, or being in support of. The Book of Enoch is no longer regarded as factual or canonical within the Church. The only Orthodox Christian Church that still uses the Book of Enoch as validated is the Ethiopian Church. Although many of the world's Christian churches no longer regard it as factual, many scholars have concluded that the Book of Enoch was highly influential to early Christianity. R. H. Charles, an early 20th century theologian who wrote some of the most important works on biblical subjects during his time, who also translated the Book of Enoch, says the influence of one Enoch on the New Testament has been greater than all of the other apocryphal books put together. It has been said by Dr. Charles Francis Potter, another 20th century theologian and author, that the Book of Enoch was a go-to manual for the Apostle Paul in which he carried with him everywhere he went. It is also apparent to scholars on the subject that many of Jesus' sayings are paraphrases from the book of Enoch, and above all of this, from the New Testament book of Jude, within verses 14 through 15, the book of Enoch is directly quoted from. Many have debated why the book of Enoch has not been widely canonized, either stating that it was left out due to conspiracy or simply because it is fictitious and does not belong within the more serious books of the Bible. The book of Enoch is a mysterious story that chronicles the journey of not just the prophet Enoch, but that of a group of fallen angels responsible for mankind's corruption. Enoch is vehemently idolized within occult organizations, specifically Freemasonry. According to Freemason legend, 
Enoch built several vaults underground, each containing sacred relics and documents. Above ground, where the vaults lay, he placed two columns, one of marble so that it could not be destroyed by fire, and one of brick so that it would not be washed away. On those stone columns, it is said that he inscribed the fundamental sacred sciences of mankind to be found and deciphered by a future generation after the flood. Within the first book of the Bible, Genesis, many alternative scholars on esoteric subjects have examined the obscure story about the sons of God kidnapping earth women and mating with them, creating the abominable offspring known as the Nephilim. The Bible, within chapter 6 of Genesis, briefly glances over this story, saying that after the strange offspring of these giant Nephilim, God attempts to wipe this genetic lineage off the face of the earth with a massive flood. The Bible doesn't go any deeper into detail with this story. However, what makes the Book of Enoch and its writings fascinating is that it does go deeper into this story. What we find is that a group of fallen angels with corporeal bodies descend upon the Middle East on Mount Hermon and make a pact with one another and conspire to seduce and abduct the women of Earth. And among this, they also teach the people of Earth sacred sciences which were forbidden by their superiors to be taught to us. Enoch is visited by righteous archangels and is also showed secrets and is told to prophesize against these fallen angels and warn his lineage of the coming disaster which would be the flood. J.T. Millick, 20th century theologian and scholar, wrote what could be considered the most prolific work about the Book of Enoch and analyzed it extensively. In his 1975 work titled The Books of Enoch, Aramaic Fragments of Qumran Cave 4, he concludes that the verses in Genesis in the Old Testament involving Enoch and the Nephilim are a summary of the Book of Enoch and the story of the Watchers that the book of Enoch originally preceded the Bible itself. The church was afraid to teach the book of Enoch because of its daunting and strange story having to do with fallen angels having physical bodies akin to us and mating with humans and possibly creating an offspring that might still exist today. According to the biblical book of Leviticus on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the most holy of days in the Jewish calendar, the ancient Israelites would sacrifice two goats. This holiday is a day of repentance or atonement for wrongdoings. It is said that the ancient Israelites would sacrifice one goat to God that he may take this as a symbolic gesture of their deserving of such punishment, while the other goat was cursed and was spiritually placed as to represent all the evil doings of Azazel, the leader of the fallen angels in the book of Enoch. The goat for Azazel was seen symbolically as all the wrongdoings of the past, and it was led to a cliff where it was thrown off to represent Azazel and the fallen angels. This was a symbolic cleansing and absolving of sin. The idea of angels interacting with mankind, whether it's through a physical interaction or a spiritual interaction through a seance of some sort, it is clear we've been fixated on this possible experience since time immemorial. The exciting possibility of angels being real has enticed Christians and occultists to make outlandish claims about the inspiration for their life's work. It is not my goal to prove if angels or demons exist, but to show that as a culture we have deeply felt a connection with the history of these beings and to the extreme believe they have directly contributed to our upbringing as a species on this earth. Lucifer, for the Christian, represents the original sin of our wanting to be apart from God and be independent in our lives through the gnosis of the fallen angels. For the occultist, Lucifer represents the cause to be sovereign in our own endeavors with the knowledge given to us by the fallen angels that God sought to deny us. As I have alluded to throughout this documentary, all these mythologies stem back to a source within the Middle East, specifically speaking, in Sumeria. If we understand that the Bible, the Old Testament, 
has borrowed a lot of its mythologies and molded them from the old world, including Sumer, then we understand that the story of these fallen angels goes farther back than just the Judaic time period. As I wrap up this documentary, I will conclude this by revealing who Lucifer really was in our ancient past, if there ever was one, by analyzing the Sumerian culture and its mythology. Chapter 5 The Sumerian Connection Without the Sumerian culture, specifically its mythology, there would be no Judaism and probably no gods of any religion as we know them. Christianity spawned from Judaism, which came from a plethora of the Old World cultures, such as those of the Canaanites, Egyptians, Hittites, and Persians, and all of them eventually leading back to the oldest known culture, the Sumerians. How we know about this is due to a group of scholars, Samuel Noah Kramer, Sir Charles Leonard Woolley, Austin Henry Layard, and more who excavated the Middle East from the 1800s through the 1900s. From them, we know that Sumer was initially settled between 4500 to 4000 BCE. By the third millennium BCE, Sumer had 12 separate city-states of all great stature. Sumer, situated in what today is known as Iraq, was a prime place in the ancient days for all sorts of commerce and lifestyle. The Sumerians will forever be accredited with being the inventors of the wheel, pottery, the first system of writing, the first codes, laws, the first city-states, government, and more. Their mythology, which involved multiple deities, was the basis for all religions to come after them. Their tales were written on hardened clay tablets thousands of years before the Bible was written in its Judaic form. One major example, yet minuscule, in the mass of evidence that the Sumerians were the progenitors in mythology to all religions is their flood myth. Their flood story is obviously the original that the Bible copied from. In the Bible's version, within Genesis, there is one God who is contemplating to destroy mankind, yet allowing its lineage to continue by saving one man and his family. In the Sumerian version, also known as the Atrahasis Epic, we see that it is not one God, but two gods. Matter of fact, two brother gods by the name of Enki and Enlil who are contemplating this plan to allow mankind to be destroyed by a coming flood or catastrophe. It is the militant and vindictive Enlil who wants mankind to be destroyed by this catastrophe. And it is the clever and scientific Enki who decides to save mankind and therefore betraying the pact he made with his brother Enlil. These gods were known as the Anunnaki gods who were a part of a larger family of these deities, also known as the Anuna. In all Anuna mythology, be it Sumerian, Akkadian, Assyrian, and even up to Babylonian, Enki and Enlil always had somewhat of a rivalry. It was in the original Atrahasis flood story where we can see this play out. It was Enlil who decided to let this flood wash over us in secrecy, while his brother Enki deceitfully agreed. Enki sought out one of his human descendants to warn about this calamity. Enki was known to interbreed with humans and spawn his seed among us. It was Enki, the chief scientist of the Anuna, with his half-sister, Ninma, who were originally given the task to create us, according to the Sumerian tales. Enki had a deep admiration for our evolutionary progress. Samuel Noah Kramer, a name to remember, was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the latter half of the 20th century. He was an expert on Assyriology and would later become a leading pioneer and expert on the Sumerian civilization. His colleague, Dr. Joburg, curator of the Babylonian Tablet Collection and director of the Sumerian Dictionary Project, said of Kramer that he really rediscovered the whole Sumerian literature. On Kramer's contribution to the field, he says that it is so basic that the field may be said to have been completely transformed, almost created by him. With his expertise, Kramer remarked during his lifetime that 
One remarkable fact is that only a century ago, nothing was known even of the existence of these Sumerians in ancient days. The very name Sumer had been erased from the mind and memory of man for more than 2,000 years. Yet today, the Sumerians are one of the best known peoples of the ancient Near East. And this is because they wrote down almost all of the minutia of their lives, from legalities, diaries, transactions, to full-on mythology and history on baked hardened clay tablets, which stood the test of time. According to former part-time professor at Marist College in New York, Joshua J. Mark, some of their inventions, which helped form the basis for all civilizations, are the rudimentary invention of time, a system of numbers, the 360-degree circle, geometry, the first wheeled vehicles, children's toys, riding, riding implements, harnessing the wind, the domestication of animals, agricultural developments such as irrigation, medical advances, dentistry, architectural developments, and urbanization. The Sumerians believed that they were deliberately created by a race of beings known in ancient times by many names, such as the popular Anuna or Anunnaki. These people, our progenitors, were headed by a majority group of about 12 leading deities, consisting of male and some female. The leader of those top gods was An, or Anu. His ruling realm was the heavens, or outer space, beyond earth. His symbol was a star. These beings were not seen as metaphors for natural phenomena. Although throughout time, they were combined with cosmological tales, just as streets are named after presidents, so were stars and planets named after them. An was thought of and worshipped as a real being, along with all the others. There is an old Mesopotamian tale by the name of the Tale of Adapa. In this story, the gods prepare Adapa, one of humanity's earliest prototypes, to go up to heaven, or the heavens, to visit An, so that An may be entertained by the intellect of this new creature. An was real to our ancestors. His abode was reachable, as in this tale, which describes the gods taking Adapa skyward to meet the great leader of the Anuna. Second in command was his rightful heir and son, Enlil. He was the militant and judicial ruler alongside his father. It was he who the rest of the gods had to consult with for any serious matter. He too had temples dedicated to him. Every major Sumerian god had their own city or cities that they would personally oversee. Those cities would worship this local god. The third most prominent god was Enki. He was An's firstborn, but not of a royal half-sister so he was not the rightful heir. In ancient times, succession of dynastic rule was the norm. Kingship was always passed down through familial ties as pure as possible. This struggle would be at the basis for the rest of humanity's plight, who would be caught in between the warring bloodlines of the gods, piecing it all together with the writings of the Sumerians and their contemporaries and descended kingdoms like the Akkadians, Babylonians, and such we arrive at a peculiar story. The texts themselves tell us that when they came here, primarily landing in the Middle East about 400,000 years ago, certain parts of the earth were inundated with marshlands and overgrown nature. It was they who artificially constructed the lands to be habitable. Such proclamations can be seen in texts like the one known as Enki and the World Order. As they set themselves up, they went to work. The work became too much to bear, so they eventually decided to upgrade the existing hominid and jumpstart evolution to create the Homo sapien man as a worker race. It was this species that would eventually become the intelligent, civilization-building Sumerian. As time went on, the gods looked favorably on a few unique humans, such as Adapa, and occasionally granted us with special knowledge. Thus, the eventual serpent in the Garden of Eden story. The development from Sumerian polytheistic beliefs to the Judaic monotheistic one was a complex process that involved cultural shifts and the loss of understanding as these deities and the ages with them faded away. In an astounding report done by Jeanette Fink, 
for the British Museum titled The Babylonian Text of Nineveh, we learn that the bold Babylonian king, Ashurbanipal, was able to read the stone tablets from before the flood. This was in the late 7th century BCE. By then, it was rare that anyone knew about Sumer, and even more so for anyone to be able to read their cuneiform inscriptions. This loss of understanding is what has also led to not just the Judeo-Christian religious fallacies, but the satanic Luciferian fantasies as well. The Sumerian stories of Anuna set up the foreground and philosophy in which the later Luciferian doctrines would follow. From Sumer, our earliest modern civilization spawned the legends of the deities, grand and powerful, who created us. Among them were higher-ranking gods who would congregate and discuss matters pertaining to our growth and judgment. After the Sumerians, many cultures followed, taking the premise of the Sumerian mythos and formulated it further into what made sense for their times and people. The Sumerians gave us the idea of divine beings and that they might have created us. Their divine beings were seen as real people who lived longer than we did, but aged indeed and eventually died or left earth. Now, of course, Lucifer never existed within the Bible and was concocted by mistranslations and then further fanaticized by pop culture. However, when we take a look at the ideology of Lucifer being the serpent in the Garden of Eden, we can trace that character back to Sumer. Among the old Anunnaki gods, Lucifer is and always has been the Sumerian deity Enki. Within the Sumerian verbiage, there was the term Ushumgal, which literally meant great serpent or wise serpent, and many of their deities were given this title of Ushumgal, and one of them, above all, was Enki. Sir Henry Rawlinson, considered the father of Assyriology, is probably the first to claim that the Eden story is based on Sumerian lore. Of Enki, he states that he functions as the source of all knowledge and science, and that he is figured by the great serpent, which occupies so conspicuous a place among the symbols of the gods on the black stones recording Babylonian benefactions. E. Douglas, a pioneer in the studies on Mesopotamia, says of Enki in his work, The Flowing Vase and the God with Streams, published in 1933. Thus, Enki is Lord of Hidden, Unfathomable Knowledge, the Counselor of Gods and Men, the God of Oracles, which he revealed to men in dreams, the Chief Magician of the Gods, in whose province were all spells, the Great Exorcist. E. O. James, Professor of History and Philosophy of Religion at the University of London, wrote about Enki in his book, The Ancient Gods, saying that Enki was the personification of divine wisdom and the source of all esoteric knowledge. In closing, what I would like to say is that Lucifer never existed in the Bible. Again, he was constructed as an archetype through the beauty of human imagination. Religion, specifically the Abrahamic faiths, derived from the Sumerian culture. If there ever were fallen angels, or deities who interacted with humans, they were definitely the Anunnaki whom our ancestors spoke of. If there ever was a rebellious god who sympathized with humans, seeking to pass down knowledge and wisdom despite the strict orders of the other gods, it was Enki. Archetypes play a huge role in how we understand life and reality. Just as we have a collective conscious, we have a collective subconscious. In the depths of the collective subconscious, the gods we knew and the gods we create remain, influencing our lives through manifested anomalies and spiritual experiences. We are a mind, and without one, our bodies are but a carnal mechanical vessel. Our brains are the center of transmission, receiving the signal of consciousness, and in doing so, they relay it through the human experience. The heart, lungs, and any other vital organ, when severed, are just the instruments of the brain's soul and well-being. When all stops, the transmission fades back to where it belongs, with the source of all in an unconditional love. In this simulation, our plight, 
is all just a chaotic and a righteous human mind game.